Welcome back, everybody. Uh, as promised, we are going to meet Liz again and proceed with a female case study. As you recall, Liz is a 55-year-old symptomatic postmenopausal woman. She has all the symptoms. She's been postmenopausal for five years. She's miserable. She has vaginal dryness, hot flashes, night sweats, no energy, but feels anxious. Her mind can't stop racing. She has trouble sleeping, wakes multiple times, has multiple food cravings, and feels that if she doesn't eat, she'll get hypoglycemic. And this primarily occurs in the morning. When you hear that, you should think cortisol, you should think insulin resistance. She's happily married, she has grown children. She's a physician and has a very busy practice. As you can see, she has a normal body weight and BMI. She exercises regularly, seven days a week, and, and I think she probably over-exercises. She takes vitamin D, calcium, <clears throat> excuse me, and a multivitamin after a recent bone mineral density documented osteopenia. The remainder of her history is otherwise unremarkable. Here are her baseline labs, and what I want to point your attention to is this fasting insulin of three, which means that she may have some evidence of beta cell fatigue, which... Uh, which... Um, which may push her over the edge towards diabetes. Her hemoglobin A1C is already 5.9. When we look at her thyroid hormones, we could you can get a hint for what's going on. Her TSH is normal. Her T4 is normal. Her T3 is on the high side based on what we previously talked about. Think high cortisol think type 2 allostasis, her reverse T3 is low, she has negative antibodies. She's inflamed with a C-reactive protein of 2, and her DHEAS is on the low side. And due to her supplementation, her vitamin D is normal. So what did I think? She's a symptomatic postmenopausal woman with probable HPA access dysfunction. She's got low DHEAS, and she has poor sleep hygiene. She's got insulin resistance with beta cell fatigue, pushing her way towards uh, diabetes along that continuum. She's got evidence of type 2 thyroid allostasis with a slightly elevated T3. She's got osteopenia, and she's an over-exerciser. So what additional tests do we want to do? Well, we're going to do a Dutch Plus. It's going to give us lots and lots of in information. Now, let's just look at the big picture. When you look at her cortisone and her cortisol, though not identical, they're kind of similar. They're both high. And as you see, and I want to point out to you, this is saliva. But if this were urine, you would not need to do a car because a car would be hot, right? Her cortisols are all high. Uh, the AM cortisol is high, which tells me she doesn't sleep well. And then she, her 30 minute is also high. And so they're kind of balanced. And when you look at her 11 beta HSD one and two activity, you see that the dials are going in the same direction. So there's nothing concerning there. She has high cortisone and high cortisol. But when you look at her metabolites, what you see is that she's favoring cortisone. Why is that? The liver is trying to deactivate this systemic high cortisol state. It's trying to get us back to a state of equilibrium. And so what are we going to do? Lifestyle, again, 90 days, I tell people, we're going to take away gluten and dairy. Uh, that's what we're going to eliminate why it's inflammatory. We're going to put her on a lower carb eating plan. We are going to give her complex carbohydrates. They're very important for the gut microbiome. Butyrate feeds the enterocytes. Butyrate's an immune modulator. It helps with that mucosal layer. And we want to give her, whether it be vegetables or on complex carbohydrates or in a supplement, she needs to get 25 to 30 grams of daily fiber. That's where we're going to start. We're going to meet her where she is. 
We're also going to give her probiotics. We're going to give her omega-3 fish oil, vitamins, complex B vitamins, hormones drain B vitamins. So you got to make sure they have enough reserve and you want to give them more. We're going to give her magnesium. And again, magnesium taurate is very calming. You could choose magnesium glycinate. I wouldn't use magnesium oxide uh, unless you want her to have uh, excessive bowel movements. We're going to continue her vitamin D, but we're going to add K2 MK7. K2 MK7 takes calcium and shuttles it towards the bone and away from the vascular tree, which is, as you recall, you want. You don't want, you know, increased uh, thrombotic events. You don't want increased risk of stroke, uh, chronic kidney disease. And she's willing to do IV therapy. She's got the resources. And what she said to me, I'd rather go get IV therapy twice a month than take a ton of pills. So that's what we're going to do with her. And then once again, this is just a reminder of the adaptogens and where they work and what they work on. And remember, if you ever are going to use glandulars, be careful in individuals who have TPO antibodies. She does not, uh, as you we know, have low cortisol, so this is not an issue. And licorice, what does licorice work in low cortisol? It inhibits the conversion of cortisol to cortisone. And so when somebody like Liz, who's got mind racing, has got this elevated car, two very nice choices, L-theanine and rhodiola. You could use Rolora for her food cravings. Um, you could use, she's got brain fog, RG3, but let's target what her chief complaints are. And in addition, she's got low melatonin, has trouble sleeping. Uh, let's give her melatonin. Melatonin, once again, is the body's most potent extracellular antioxidant. And so when we start rhodiola, start low, go slow, titrate it up slowly, we're going to give her L-theanine. L-theanine doesn't make people sleepy. And a melatonin trochee. Why a trochee? Because if somebody has gut dysbiosis, what's going to happen is you don't know how much they're going to absorb. So a trochee uh, will be absorbed directly, and it's really a one to two ratio. So for example, if you give a 10 milligram trochee, it'll be 20 milligrams of oral. Uh, melatonin. Now, typically I start at two and a half to five milligrams unless I'm treating somebody who's at high risk for breast or colon cancer or for any hormonally driven cancer. Why? Uh, the data has shown that if you give them anywhere between 25 and 50 milligrams a day, you will decrease their uh, incidence of cancer. And so, again, in somebody who I was worried about, uh, breast or colon cancer, I would give them, say, 15 milligrams in a trochee at night at bedtime. I'm going to give her some sublingual DHEA drops. Again, I want to avoid if she has dysbiosis, which I think she does, uh, oral DHEA. Just start really low, go slow. And to balance her immune system, she's inflamed, we're going to give her some plant sterols especially that high cortisol is going to drive inflammation. All right, what about her hormones? Well, her FSH is greater than 100. None of this is surprising. She's got no hormones. She hasn't had hormones for five years. A reminder, estradiol in men, estradiol, testosterone and progesterone in women must be measured with LCMSMS because at the lower limits where we're measuring, LCMSMS is the most reliable. The literature states that, guidelines state that. In somebody like Liz, no one should be surprised that her serum hormone binding globulin is at the lower limit of normal, Why? or even low. Why? Number one, she's insulin resistant. Number two, she doesn't have hormones, and her prolactin is normal. So let's come over here and look at her estrogen metabolism. Not surprising, everything is low. Let me orient you. This is your postmenopausal area. This is your follicular area. And this is your luteal range. And so she is clearly, not surprisingly, in the postmenopausal range. Now, when we look and you say, Doreen, why are you measuring hormones 
in urine in somebody who has no hormones, what is it going to tell you? It's going to tell you trends. And so the first thing I do when people have really, really low hormones, I look at my favorite little circle. And it says that the expected ranges are right here, 2, 4, and 16 hydroxy. And I look at the patient, 78.4. That's pretty good. 7.5 to 11. Oh, that's high. And that's low. So what we want to do is try and shift the metabolism, uh, preferentially favoring phase two, move that dial. But we need to make sure she's got that she methylates, that she has adequate methylation to detoxify those estrogens. And in a sense, she does. But you know what we want to make sure of is that we maintain this adequate methylation. And what about her androgens? Well, once again, when you give people progesterone, especially oral micronized progesterone, you're not going to see, as you would with endogenous progesterone, a serum equivalent. Why is that? Because when you swallow progesterone, it goes to the liver and all you, it goes through first pass metabolism and you're going to see metabolites. So what is a urine going to tell you? Well, it's going to tell you about pathway predominance. It's going to tell you about metabolites. What it'll tell you is that, for example, if she had really high 5-alpha predominance and she had trouble sleeping and you wanted to give her a high dose of progesterone to improve her sleep, it's not going to improve her sleep. She already is preferentially going down that pathway. Uh, the enemy of good is better. You're not going to make her better if she's already predominating down that pathway. So really, uh, metabolomics helps you with, number one, how people are metabolizing and whether or not what you're doing is going to, in essence, be helpful. So if you used vaginal progesterone, say, in her, again, the vaginal mucosa doesn't have 5-alpha and beta reductase. So you're not, it's going to be underrepresented. You're not even going to see good metabolites. And so if you're using vaginal progesterone, test serum. If you're using oral micronized progesterone, there really is no good test. You give progesterone at night. We test in the morning. And oral micronized progesterone after you swallow it peaks in one to four hours, so it's not really representative. But metabolites will help you about pathway preference. Now let's shift over here and look at her other androgens. DHEAS is on the low side, but her metabolites look okay. And so as I reminded you previously, when you see a lower DHEAS and then you look at the metabolites, if they're okay, think inflammation. Sulfation is decreased. But in addition, you don't want to pound somebody if they're metabolizing a lot of DHEAS. You want to fix the underlying etiology because what's going to happen? They're just going to metabolize it some more. And then when we talk about uh, balanced uh, activity regarding 5-alpha and beta reductase, from here and here, it looks pretty balanced. So we don't really know. But again, when we're talking about testosterone, serum is the default. But we really need to understand how testosterone is metabolized. And before we dose testosterone, we want to look at our metabolites. And here we see that, not surprisingly, testosterone is at the lower end of the reference range. DHT is at the lower end. It's within normal, but it's low. You'd like to see it at three and a half, four. Five androstine diol is low. And it looks like she may favor five beta, uh, the five beta pathway, but it's hard to tell with just one. Uh, marker. And epitestosterone is also low. Just need to be aware when you give testosterone um, uh, about uh, metabolites. And, you know, when we talk about testosterone metabolism and excretion, it's really more complicated than just looking at one pathway or the other. Whenever you're going to evaluate metabolomics and you're looking at phase two metabolism, of which you do in urine, 
we are making the assumption that phase two metabolism is normal. And most of the time we can do that. However, testosterone is subject to phase two SNPs that can limit its clinical utility. And the UGT enzymes play a key role in androgen homeostasis. And this is where the SNPs are most commonly found. And so testosterone goes to the liver, gets glucuronidated, and then goes into the urine. If this doesn't happen correctly, urinary testosterone will underrepresent what's happened systemically. And this is a study that was done looking at Caucasian men versus Korean men, and they looked at the UGT 2B17 SNP. And what they found is Caucasian males, serum testosterone level was significantly higher than Korean men, and their excretion was significantly higher than uh, Asian men. And what they found is that epitestosterone was the same in both groups, which tells us that a different enzyme SNP is associated with epitestosterone versus testosterone. And UGT2B17 SNPs occur commonly in Asian males. So you have to be aware in your Asian male patients that you know, this is a possibility. It also occurs in about 10 to 15% of African-American male. It's really, really important. So uh, what does all this mean? Well, first, UGT2B17 conjugates testosterone, 5-alpha DHT, and 5-beta androstane diol, where UGT2B7 conjugates epitestosterone and 5-androstane diol. So what does this mean? So if you see androgens in, in, in either men or women, because this is applicable to women too, but we'll talk about why it's a little more complicated in women. And you look at testosterone and you see low testosterone, but normal D epitestosterone, okay? Now you look at DHT and 5-beta androstane diol and they're low. Think UGT SNP, especially if 5-alpha follows suit with epitestosterone. So definitely, if you didn't do uh, serum, you need to do serum. And as we talked about earlier, because of this, serum is really the primary tool. I would not, would not just do serum alone. You're going to have an incomplete story. You're going to have an incomplete story about estrogen, estrogen metabolites, androgen metabolites, and cortisol. I say urine is a useful adjunct, and in fact, I would say it is a useful must. I would cross that out and say must, because you won't get a complete picture. In Asian individuals, just be aware, estrogens work just fine. You'll see estrogen metabolism just fine. And so males or females who are on HRT, we just talked about this, and now we have to ask ourselves, what is epitestosterone? Because I talked about it. Epitestosterone is an epimer of testosterone. It's made by the testes. It's not androgenic. It is made in similar concentrations to testosterone, and that's why if you see this pattern where this is made normally, and this is low, that's your first hint that there's a UGT SNP. The problem with epitestosterone in women is that testosterone comes from not only the ovaries, it comes from the adrenals and peripheral conversion. So nobody knows what to, how to really uh, interpret epitestosterone. But it is a good marker for whether or not a woman has the UGT SNP because of liver conjugation. All right, now let's get back to our patient. Let me go back a couple of slides here to our Liz. And as you see, her epitestosterone is low just like testosterone. Her DHT is low, 
five beta androstenone dial is normal. So she has no evidence of a UGT SNP, and we wouldn't expect her to. Now let's look at her organic acids. Why organic acids? They add another layer to give us some insight, not only about redox potential, but about vitamins and minerals, about neurotransmitters. And so let's look at vitamin B12 and vitamin B6 markers. Currently, they're within normal range. But glutathione looks like it's on the higher end, which means that she needs more glutathione. She's peeing out this metabolite. She doesn't have enough glutathione. But really important, I use these markers, especially VMA and uh, HVA, to look at the autonomic nervous system. So if I have somebody, and this just goes along with her high cortisol, but say she had low cortisol and her VMA was elevated, that would tell me that she, I don't want to aggressively lower this uh, met, uh, her norepinephrine and epinephrine. She may be living off of that and her cortisol, that may be keeping her going. And if I precipitously do something to alter her norepinephrine and epinephrine, she may feel worse. So use these along with your cortisol metabolites and your diurnal pattern to really assess her overall HPA autonomic nervous system. And as you see here, as we saw before, her melatonin was low and uh, her oxidative stress marker, one marker is not elevated, which is a good thing. So now what? Well, what are we going to do? Estradiol, well, she was willing to take a patch uh, and she wanted vaginal E3. So we started with a 0.025 milligram transdermal estradiol patch, which is the typical starting dose, and vaginal E3. This was compound at 0.5 milligrams per gram. So we applied one gram, which is a half a milligram, vaginally at night times two weeks every day then twice a week times two weeks, and then PRN as needed. Progesterone, I started her off with 200 milligrams. Why? Her endometrium is thin, it's atrophic. If I give her estrogen with, you know, uh, say 100 milligrams, she may have spotted. The data says that in women who have estradiol levels less than 10, they're more apt at serum, they're more apt to spot. So if I give her a higher dose of progesterone, uh, then I will kind of start protecting that endometrium and then I'll drop it down. Uh, she did not want to use vaginal uh, progesterone, which would have been my choice, and I would have given her, if it were vaginal, 100 milligrams a night, probably for a few months, and then, you know, dropped it back. We started off with testosterone cream. Why didn't I just give her a pellet? I want to see how she metabolizes. If I start off with a pellet, then what's going to happen? I can't take it out. Now, if I did start with a pellet, if she didn't want a pellet, which is an option, I probably would have given her a uh, 100 milligram pellet, the same 0.25, I would have done uh, nothing different. And then she got DIM and IC3. Uh, I gave her 500, uh, 500 milligrams of DIM BIB. And then I was going to follow up after three treatment months with labs. And what was I going to do? A four spot dry urine for hormones. Because remember, I showed you earlier, you can monitor hormones, estradiol, in urine. I want metabolites. I want cortisol and metabolites. I want testosterone metabolites. And then I was going to do a CBC, uh, FSH, and LH. I like to see how I drop their FSH and LH right? They're gonatotropins. I want to see that I'm giving her enough estradiol uh, 
uh, and progesterone and testosterone to drop her FSH and LH by 50%. I'm never going to get it below 25, but I want to see it drop by 50% at least. Serum hormone binding globulin to see what it's doing. Uh, albumin to uh, look at free uh, testosterone. And I just do this because it's included. Let me see what her serum and urine uh, look like comparably uh, as long as she's getting blood. There will be times I won't do this uh, at all. And so here is her uh, treatment plan, a Mediterranean low glycemic load eating plan with 25 to 30 grams of fiber, 10 servings of vegetables and two servings of fruits. Uh, here I put Rolora, but theoretically, I decided I was going to give her uh, rhodiola and L theanine, chelated magnesium, melatonin, estradiol, vaginal estriol, progesterone, testosterone, and I3C I three C or dip. I was going to continue her vitamin D at K2MK7. I was going to continue her calcium, continue resistance training. There's her probiotic a multivitamin, B complex, multi-minerals, right? Because thyroid requires minerals, um, omega-3 fish oil, and IV therapy that included all of those things. And let me point to you to something that I found striking when I first looked at this, that really the gold standard for salivary testing and really that's been validated over and over is cortisol and you can only get CAR. In serum, you can get these things. Yeah, you can measure a cortisol and there's data on uh, you know, cortisol, but it's not as robust and it's really one point in time. And if you stick somebody, the cortisol may be up. But really when you look at a Dutch urine test, you get not only production, you get metabolism, you get cortisol, the same diurnal pattern, remember I showed you was statistically equivalent, but you get metabolomics, which is very important to understanding the complete picture. And then you get organic acids and neurotransmitters and oxidative stress markers and melatonin. So you get the biggest bang for your buck by doing a Dutch urine test. And the other reason to do Dutch, it's validated. It's published. And that's very, very important. And this is just a uh, sheet that you can print off that looks at each of the delivery systems and how best to monitor them. But what I, wanna, what I wanna show you that, you know, really is important is that not everything is optimally monitored with urine. And the nice thing about Dutch is that they tell you that. They want you to take the best care of your patient, utilizing the best tools to optimize hormone health. And with that, I leave you. And maybe you're feeling like this. May I, may I be excused? My brain is full. The end.